This is the first time we've come together when it's been sunshiny outside. So this is a good omen. It's getting better. It's going to be nicer. That's the way transit will be as the transit, the conversation continues. We'll have more and brighter, and you'll feel better about it every day. Okay. Well, uh, tonight uh, is um, a, a real, a real I, I want to use a word that my dad used to use, a real treat. But that, I don't want to trivialize Michael by saying Michael's a treat. But tonight we have an opportunity um, that I, I hope you appreciate as much as, um, as I, I know I have in experience, and that is having some time with Michael Skipper. Um, a, a nice setup. Uh, Carrie and I were down in Columbia today having lunch with Harvey Church, an alum of uh, the program. And uh, in fact, Mayor Dickey was there, and it was just a kind of a good conversation. And all that Harvey wanted to talk about was getting Michael to come down and speak. He was naming the Kiwanis Club and, uh, and um, the um, uh, Forward Murray and all of the kinds of things uh, that, that they were into as a way of, of expanding the, the transit conversation in Murray County. And they're also involved with Michael and staff about adding Murray County to the Nashville uh, area MPO uh, in, entity. So that was to me a great setup for this meeting because uh, Michael is in demand. And, uh, and is probably recognized as uh, one of the, the best spokespersons about all of the uh, dimensions of transportation, not just now, but as we try to anticipate them through the planning process. And I'm not going to steal Michael's thunder because he'll talk a little bit about this, but in many ways he personifies why many, many years ago now Congress created the Metropolitan Planning Organization, the MPO concept for uh, coordinating federal funds with state and local funds, coordinating planning with fund allocations and all of the complications that go on, and many of you are involved in this process in various ways, um, that all these things that go on in trying to, to link resources with, with problems and maybe find solutions, and the problems often defined in terms of future needs. Hopefully, most of the problems we really do try to deal with are those things that we anticipate are coming at us as opposed to trying to patch potholes that occurred last night. That has to happen, but, but hopefully we're ahead of most of the investments that we need to make. So Michael is the executive director of the, the Nashville Area Metropolitan Planning Organization, and as you will see, uh, we have two MPOs uh, that, that cover the area we represent. The other is the Clarksville Metropolitan uh, Planning Organization. And, Stan Williams is the executive director, Michael's counterpart in Clarksville, and is a graduate of this program. He uh, went through uh, the Leadership Academy a couple classes back, uh, and Michael and, uh, and Stan and their relative staffs work very well at coordinating the activities. But Michael does have the formal title of executive director of the Nashville Area MPO. Um, the second part of my introduction uh, of Michael to you um, relates to uh, a role that he will talk about, but he's very modest. And it's one we have talked about and many of you are aware of, and that is the support that the MPO, Michael and his staff, provide to the Mayor's Caucus of Middle Tennessee. Um, I've been fortunate in the last uh, several years to be asked by the Chamber to meet with different cities when they think about bringing a delegation on an inner city visit to Nashville. So they send an advanced group out and they come and they talk about issues and they try to work them what the agenda will be for these two or three days when their leaders are here in town. And we do the same thing. In fact, we're going to Vancouver, British Columbia uh, in a few weeks uh, doing that. And so um, in those conversations, the mayor's caucus comes up. Um, people have heard about it, want to know more about it. Um, and Michael talks about the structure of these 40 some mayors, 10 county mayors, and. And, and city and, and, and uh, community mayors that exist in Middle Tennessee and how, how they work together. And, and it talks about meetings are held and they, they have dialogue and they don't make official decisions. They have this collegiality uh, relationship. What he doesn't say, and what I want to say to you by way of introducing Michael, is there was no script written for how that was to evolve. Uh, Michael saw this uh, back in 2000, actually before 2009, but saw the importance of regional collaboration, understood in working with his colleagues and other MPOs around the country how, how critical that was, saw that we have no institutional relationship. In fact, 
Reggie, some of the work that we did was really, thank God, because ECD was there and was, was asking questions that went beyond county and city, city boundaries. Uh, but Michael had that vision, and I'll stop in a minute, Michael. <laughs> but Michael had that vision and realized that, that for an organization like that to exist, the worst thing that would happen is to try to figure out where the money would come from to support them in doing this work. How do we get bylaws established? How do we deal with freedom of information? How do we, how do we make this a, an institution when, in fact, what the mayors really wanted was just an ability to come together and talk? That was the goal come together, talk, learn together about common problems like transportation, um, and then in their formal roles on the MPO board or at the RTA or with GNRC or uh, wherever else they were working together, they would then act on the collegial and the, and the, and the cognitive kinds of things that they had shared as mayors coming together. Um, I, I would, if I were writing an article about the Mayor's Caucus of Middle Tennessee, I would say that that wouldn't have happened uh, uh, unless two things were in place. Number one, the leaders, the mayors themselves wanted to do it. That, very important, including the national mayor. Very important if you think about it. Number two, if Michael hadn't provided the, 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 the spread table to do it. Spreading the table so it was easy to come together, share that meal together, um, and, and they didn't have to waste their time. Well, I'll put in 10 bucks if you'll put in 10 bucks. Or who's going to send out the calendar notice for the next meeting? I can't make it, you can't make it. That was just done so that they came together, just like a good family gathering when somebody cooks a good meal and all you focus on is the good time you have together. That's the way the Mayor's Caucus has evolved to this very moment. And the leadership that Michael and his staff at the MPO have provided um, has really been a, a, a critical element. Again, the willingness of the mayors and the provision of this arrangement for them to come together uh, is uh, absolutely a, a, a unique thing. Uh, we, the model was borrowed from Denver, as we've talked about before, uh, but ironically and interestingly, the Denver Chamber is coming back to visit Nashville, and they want to look at how we've made this go to the next generation. So that's a real tribute. So what we will do tonight, and, and Diane and I were, were kidding here a moment ago, we always kid Michael about how many slides he has, um, and we've always been kind of unfair in that we've tried to sandwich Michael's presentation into uh, the, 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 the panel discussions we had last time. And uh, the, the, the evaluations that, that you are doing now and that were done by your predecessors, those evaluations consistently said we'd like Michael to have more time. We think it's worth being able to, to spend more time and have more dialogue with Michael when he's finished. So we have no idea how many slides he has, but uh, I guarantee you when he's over, you'll maybe, how many, 150? <laughs> Yeah, Lydia's back there. She'll take care of it. So um, what we'll do is um, introduce Michael and have him kind of go through the, 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 the presentation, really go through the whole status of how we're looking at transportation today and tomorrow. Um, and then we'll have discussion following that. And then uh, the latter part of the time together, we'll, be, uh, we'll talk, Lydia and I will talk with you about some of the group work you're undertaking. And you get time to, get time to do group work. That's the more important time. So... With no more introduction, Michael Skiffer. <laughs> Let's see. Let's be sure how many I have. 104. Not bad. <laughs> well, thank you, Ed. Thanks for all the, um, the kind remarks. And I take no credit, really, for uh, anything that I say. My job is quite easy, given the evidence that we have to present to people like you and uh, and mayors across the region as to why we ought to be investing in mass transit. It's a really ca easy case to make once you start looking at all the reasons why we should be doing what we're doing. I'm going to talk about those reasons today. That's really uh, why I'm here, uh, is to talk about the evidence that was positioned to mayors across Middle Tennessee that got them so charged up about uh, pursuing mass transit. But before I do that, I'll talk a little bit about who the MPOs and who our partners are across the region, recognizing, though, that you've already sort of gotten to some of that organizational um, framework for Middle Tennessee. And I have 104 slides. Uh, I don't always know what order they're in. Uh, so uh, if I look surprised as to what's on screen, uh, it's because I had no idea what was coming next. This is a, a, a slide that I like to, to use that um, it sort of puts the MPO within the proper framework of the organizations that are involved on the 
transportation issue in Middle Tennessee. Mayor, uh, uh, Ed mentioned the Mayor's Caucus. That, we really see the Mayor's Caucus as being the, uh, the political backing to what we're trying to do with respect to mass transit. The Mayor's Caucus is not making decisions about what routes we ought to invest in or, or uh, what technologies we put down a certain quarter, but they are uh, going to be ultimately the group of local leaders that decide, um, particularly when it comes to funding the vision for transit. Uh, this, what strategy we need to put forward uh, to communities across Middle Tennessee to get that done. Uh, the MPO, uh, both the Nashville Area MPO and the Clarksville Urbanized Area MPO um, are sort of these federally established agencies that have been around for a couple decades now. now MPOs were originally established back in the late 60s, early 70s, uh, partly in response to some of the negative consequences of building out the interstate system uh, in the nation, particularly in urban areas where those interstates were uh, sort of tearing on the fabric of communities. Uh, and so as a sort of a compromise, the federal government decided to delegate the decision-making authority for how federal funds would be uh, put into infrastructure to local leaders. Uh, the, the caveat was that uh, they were going to delegate that decision-making authorities to local leaders, but require those local leaders to work together through an MPO alongside their state government to make those decisions jointly. So all the federal funding that comes to our metropolitan area has to be approved by the MPO Executive Board, which is made up of the city and county mayors and representation from uh, the state. Uh, it's, the governor sits on our board. Uh, he's typically proxy for by the Commissioner of Transportation, who will sometimes have a subsequent proxy uh, for himself. So that's the, really the collaborative form for decision making. And the, in the end, uh, the, the letter of the law is that the MPO Board is responsible for approving every single federal dollar that's invested into infrastructure, transportation infrastructure. Uh, within our region, uh, regardless of who is implementing the project, uh, whether it be the state or a local government. So the MPO is the convening force here. The RTA, as you've probably learned, has a couple of different roles. It's, a, it's an operator of transit services. Uh, it maintains transit systems. Uh, and then as recently as 2000, and now I'm fuzzy on the years, Ed, was it 2009, Diane, Ed, when the RTA enabling, leg I ought to know this, that the RTA enabling legislation yeah. passed. Yeah. Since the, the RTA uh, statute, the statute in state law that created the RTA was revised in 2009, the RTA has also taken on the role of uh, funder. Uh, so it ultimately may be the recipient of dedicated funding from the local area and will be responsible for distributing that money to projects, whether those projects be carried out by the RTA itself or by other agencies uh, across the region. So not only is it a transit agency that operates and maintains a system, but ultimately it may become a a major funder for projects across the region, regardless of who's implementing them. And of course, you know who the Transit Alliance is, but the Transit Alliance and Cumberland Region Tomorrow, both nonprofit uh, groups that are made up of primarily uh, business and community interests that make the sort of the real world case for why we need to be shifting policies with respect to growth and development, growth management, and transportation infrastructure investments. The MPO I mentioned is sort of the, the convening of the interest within our metropolitan area uh, uh, with a shared responsibility to uh, select projects for federal funding. Uh, increasingly so, the state DOT, TEDA, also relies on the NPO to pick projects for state funding. It doesn't work that uh, precisely all the time, but more and more they really see the NPO as the conduit for interfacing with local governments at the state level to define the projects that are on a state-funded work program. Um, but think of the MPO as not a, a third-party entity, but just really the place that all of the responsible players come together to, to make joint decisions about transportation investments. Our MPO planning area is uh, parts of seven counties right now in the 10-county Middle Tennessee region. We recently took action to expand our MPO area to include all of Robertson and all of Murray counties. Uh, only portions of those counties were previously in the MPO, so we're in the process of finalizing that now. Our board has voted to do so. We are waiting on the concurrence from the governor to get that done. Um, so we're a seven county MPO planning area, and then the Clarksville urbanized area uh, is all of Montgomery County and part of Christian County, Kentucky. There are two counties in the region that are part of this sort of 10 county transit vision that are part of a, what's called a rural planning organization that's administered by the state DOT. The primary differences between an uh, MPO and an RPO is that uh, Congress requires a certain percentage of the funding to go directly to MPOs. Uh, so we not only are advising the state on their decision making process, but we have pots of money that we also control directly uh, in addition to that advisory role that we play on at the state level. The RPOs play uh, uh, purely that advisory role. So as the state is looking to invest in projects in those counties, 
the RPO, which is made up of typically county executives and local mayors, that's their opportunity to have a say in, in the projects that the state is considering for their area. That's a look at the geography. I want, I, there's a whole lot more. Part of my problem is I, I don't know when to stop talking on a slide, right? There's just so much, so much we could say that probably shouldn't be said, but um, there's a lot more happening on that slide than, than just that. So the MPO probably more recently is best known for the action that we took back in December of 2010. Uh, that's when the, the mayors from across Middle Tennessee convened to adopt the 2035 Regional Transportation Plan. And that's what I'll uh, primarily be talking about tonight, that plan and what we're doing now to update that plan. But that plan was really a major milestone for our region in that it, for the first time ever, established a vision for mass transit. We had talked about mass transit in Middle Tennessee, and there had been various proposals for transit, lots of studies occurring, but nobody had really ever uh, pulled it all together and presented it as public policy. So it is now a formal part of public policy, uh, this, this vision for mass transit as adopted by the region uh, through the MPO uh, with the 2035 Regional Transportation Plan. The plan is a, it's a federal requirement. Every urban area in America, I, I think I failed to mention every urban area in America has an MPO. Um, and MPOs are required to adopt these, these regional long-range transportation plans. Every four to five years, they need to update them. These plans need to look at least 20 years into the future. Ours will typically look about 25 years into the future, so the 2035 horizon was that 25-year period into the future that we're looking at. Uh, uh, it's an uh, it's a itemized list of projects, roadway, transit, bridges, uh, sidewalk and bicycle projects that we plan to invest in over that period of time with the revenue we think will come our way over that same period of time. But the plan itself doesn't get anything done. The, the other thing that we produce every couple of years is the transportation improvement program. This is our region's work program. This is where the money that comes from the federal government or the state government is matched up to specific projects and then authorizes those projects to move on into the, uh, to the process for project development. So once the projects are in the plan, uh, they begin, uh, once they are in the sort of the near term horizon, they get programmed into this work program, which authorizes them for, for obligation at the federal level and then we move into project development. The plan uh, accounted for about $6 billion of revenue over a 25 year period of time. And I'll put that into context here in a little bit. And the short term work program that we adopted concurrently with that plan back in 2010 was a five year work program that had about a billion dollars of investments identified into infrastructure across those six, those five to seven counties I, I referenced earlier. So that's a good number to keep in your head. Any given four to five year period, we've got about a billion dollars on the books that are going into roads and bridges and transit within Middle Tennessee um, from federal and state and local matching sources. It's about a billion dollars every four to five years. Michael. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so when you say that, you mean you actually have, you have physically have funds available? Funds have uh, been authorized at the federal. We have to make certain assumptions with uh, because the, the federal budget and the state budget are only ever approved on an annual basis in terms of the appropriations of dollars. And in the case of the federal level, not even every, every year, right? Appropriations still occur, but not necessarily the federal, but, uh, federal budget. So at the federal level, what happens is, uh, the, have you guys talked about the federal transportation bill or the, no. the authorizing legislation? So federal transportation programs and the gas tax that supports the highway trust fund that pays for those programs is authorized through a transportation bill that's sort of uh, typically spans four to six years and is passed through Congress every five to seven years. The prevailing bill right now is a two-year bill. It's called Moving Ahead for Progress in the 21st Century. Moving Ahead, something like that. Moving, I got the words right. I don't know if the articles were correct. Uh, MAP 21 is the acronym we use to describe that. That's a two-year bill. It does a couple of things. It authorizes the gas tax, which is 18.4 cents a gallon uh, at the pump that you pay. And it then authorizes the programs, the federal programs, the grant programs that that gas tax will be administered through uh, by way of the US DOT and its Federal Highway Administration and Federal Transit Administration. So that federal transportation legislation authorizes these programs. And we, we know what those amounts are as they're authorized. So when we do our budgeting, we look at whatever is authorized currently and just project those forward based, up, based on modest rates of growth. You said like bridges, but you're not including yeah, everything, 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 everything. Yeah. 
That's right. Um, yeah, we represent all modes of transportation. And I, I don't want that to be lost on you, that uh, in Middle Tennessee, trans transit is really being most aggressively pushed, not by transit agencies, but by sort of the mayors who understand what we need to do for transportation in general to deal with growth and development pressure that we see coming our way. Uh, we have no self-interest in transit other than we, we see a lot of problems on the roadway system uh, uh, today and in the future, and we think transit is the, the most viable solution to deal with a lot of those problems. Uh, this is, in fact, a look at the, the, all the roadway and bridge projects, intersection projects that were adopted into that long-range plan. So this is where the $6 billion is going. This is available on our website. Um, I try to hyperlink just about everything that we present to you. Uh, I also encourage you to push back on anything I might say that doesn't seem right to you. I'm challenging me on our, Janie's wanting to challenge me right now. Janie? Yeah. <laughs> the, before you move on, I've got a question. Okay. Thank you. The previous, we'll go back. This one? So, Good questions. The, uh, we, um, we have discretion over what our range of years are for our work program, but we must be consistent with the State Transportation Improvement Program, or the STIP. And that's because our TIP, which represents all the projects in our region, are part of the STIP by reference. So um, when the state ap approves its STIP, the State Transportation Improvement Program, that has a placeholder for our TIP. So before the feds, the Federal Highway Administration, the Federal Transit Administration will sign off on the state's transportation improvement program, they need to see the MPO's TIPs. And a lot of the most significant amounts of investment in the state TIP are actually coming from the MPO tips, as you might imagine, because that's where people live and work, right? Uh, so we have to be inclusive of at least the years included in the STIP. Uh, and to be compli in compliance. Uh, but we, uh, for example, we do a five-year work program typically, and we make it the first horizon of our plan just because we think that's easier to communicate to people. Uh, we have recently replaced this transportation improvement program with a new one that, that happened this past December, and those years are uh, 14 through 17. So the current tip is about a billion dollars for that four-year period of time. And we'll be adopting a new tip when we adopt our new plan next year, which will represent the first five years of the plan. We like this concept of it representing the first five years of the plan. We just think that makes it easier. So the, so the one just, just in that regard, CDOT, it was really important to do that coordination that Michael just mentioned because there are 11 uh, MPOs. And so, and they all have a little different approach, even though at the end, uh, each of them has the, the TIP or the tip, and to try to integrate that with their individual cycles into the STIP was a real coordinating challenge. So the three-year work program that you, you hear about every year after the legislature and the governor uh, get through the budgeting process, they always publish those projects, typically in the paper and local communities to kind of communicate what, what's coming their way. That feeds into the state transportation improvement program, but it is not exactly the STIP, right? So I hate to interrupt one more time, but this is really a very timely moment Michael can do this much better than anybody else here. This deal that is in the House bill that passed yesterday regarding the, the legislative review of the AMP or of any project that met those criteria of a center running in an urbanized or metropolitan area. In the meeting yesterday, in the House Transportation Committee meeting, the, the conversation and then in the hallway with Michael, everybody's concern was, is that the process are they referencing the process basically of coordinating all this that Michael just mentioned? And the, I think the consensus was the, the people that wrote the amendment got it right, I think, unless there's been overnight change of, of thought. Was that? Yeah, I mean, because say, for example, just to illustrate the point, the AMP project had no state dollars associated with it. There'd be a question of whether or not it would actually show up in the three-year work program because the legislature isn't interested in typically anything but, well, I shouldn't say it that way. <laughs> <laughs> they're only appropriate, <laughs> they're only, appropriate the, only appropriating money for the state share of things. So the three-year work program is very heavily focused on state-funded projects. And so if there were no state dollars involved in the AMP, and the way the amendment was originally 
thought to have been worded, we were afraid that if it didn't show up in the work program itself, then it wouldn't constitute approval by the legislature, which is what the requirement is. But the, the text that was amended into the bill yesterday clarifies that, uh, um, in some way or the other, clarifies that um, uh, we're good even if there's not state funds, even if the project's not individually listed in the three-year work program. I think it's inclusion in the STIP, again, and that's more of a federal document, um, uh, would constitute that legislative approval. But that's just on the House side. On the House side. Yeah. On the Senate side, the, there is no requirement for legislative approval. Um, that part got fixed, uh, but the, the, the Senate is making the design of the project just outright illegal. So um, it's, uh, it, even though we don't need to get the legislati legislature's approval, um, we can't do the project anyway uh, as it's currently designed because of the prohibition of discharging passengers at those center lane medians. Um, has to be approved by TDOT, but not the legislature. So that's the part that Senator Tracy, he sort of compromised on the legislative approval piece, but then added back in. And may, many of you may not know he's adding something back in because you may not know he had it there before, but the, that whole design requirement uh, was, that's okay. no, that's not okay. no. No, because then now you had the legislature designing a project, right? Right, so I mean, it's a problem. Yeah, absolutely. It actually works. It's worse. Yeah. It's worse because there is no opportunity to get legislative approval. You're just banned from doing the project altogether. And this only applies to, uh, you know, there's, you know, fancy language to make it not seem like it only applies to Metro, but this only applies to Metro and only on state routes. Um, so it's pretty restrictive in terms of its I don't, application. I don't just know how we select projects today over the You know, you have a process that you go through. Yeah, I think, um, I, I think we want to talk about that today. Um, I thought first though, like part of, the, part of the, the process really begins with looking at the future and getting a sense of the challenges that you're going to be faced with. Uh, that's what ultimately frames the, the, the policies that you put into place that will ultimately dictate the procedures for selecting projects. Um, but before we move on, are there any other questions about like, the legislation? I mean, I think the, right now the situation we're in is that uh, we are hoping that Chairman Tracy will amend on the floor to remove the Part B of his uh, bill, which is the prohibition on the center lane discharge. And we could talk about it too. If you guys think that there's merit to um, his intent to improve safety by pro, uh, to sort of not allowing center lane discharge, uh, I'm happy to talk about that. Um, but we're, ha we're hoping that he'll either remove that through an amendment on the floor or that uh, somebody will make a motion to reconcile that, uh, to take on the house language at some point. No, and if you think about it, you know, the presumption is that when you, you always stay on the side of the street that you get off the bus on. I mean, I don't know what the percentages are, but let's say it's 50% of the people that get off at the stop are probably going to walk across four lanes because the other side anyway. Typically, the center lane BRT projects, a large part of their costs are constructing the pedestrian environment. So, I mean, a large part of why this is a $175 million project is because of addressing safety concerns. And um, there's, there's no data whatsoever that suggests that center lane discharging is more dangerous than, um, in fact, uh, and I wouldn't want to present this argument today because I have no data to support uh, my hypothesis either, but one can make the case that it may be safer in the center lane because you don't have all the turning movements that you have on the curb lane. The, it's those turning movements, the driveway cuts, that just really make the curb lane design um, just not workable with respect to rapid transit. Um, just can't can't provide it that way. Of course, it has nothing to do with safety. <laughs> it did. I think. I well, my prediction is that we'll come. It was the house. We'll it worked in the house. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we're preparing for either reality, but uh, I'm pretty optimistic that. Um, we'll get through this session with, with a viable project. <coughs> you didn't answer his question. <laughs> I did answer his question. No, I thought he didn't ask me what the hypothesis is. Oh, what, what, what's this? Um, so any other questions about <laughs> the... <laughs> you were saying that the, 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 the
saying you're hoping the trade view changes. I mean, obviously, there, you know, the, the anthropologic project, what they're trying to do is, is obviously trying to, to block that, but it affects, uh, it's a statewide issue. So, like, you kind of said that you kind of have a neutral position because you're kind of more implementing um, all these projects that are coming on the local level, but, you know, who is going to, other than the, uh, the consumer, who's actually going to uh, Beth Harwell and the Jim Traces and saying, specifically sitting down with them, not writing letters and saying this is a bad idea to talk? Yeah, well, yeah, I do not have a neutral position. I mean, I've, my name is on, it has, I've well, taken, a, yeah. I've taken a side um, in, in writing and also in the media. So I'm not neutral about this. Uh, but there, everybody. I mean, everybody. I mean, every time, any, anytime anybody ever approaches me about what's going on in the legislature, I ask them to write a, le a letter to Beth Harwell. But more specifically, and Ed could talk about this probably better, better than I can. But there's a coalition behind the ant called the Ant Coalition. Uh, how did you got? How did you come up with that <laughs> name? Anyway, anyway, but the, that the there is, the yeah, there, there's significant strategy yeah. behind the. Yeah. the through the AMP Coalition to address this. And it, it, it's a pretty deep-rooted strategy to, that identifies individual legislators and their motives in order to get, get us out of the situation. And then through the Mayor's Caucus and the MPOs, we've also been writing letters. Our, our letter writing through uh, the public sector has been mostly about local control. Um, and we consider getting legislative approval for an individual project uh, uh, encroachment on local control. We also think that the legislature designing a project is also uh, violation of local control, um, and it, and even presents a, a more significant safety issues than center lane discharge to have a legislator design a project. But yeah, I mean, there, the letter writing, the phone calls, the personal visits by mayors, uh, by members of the coalition, which are largely from the business community, they've been very effective. Uh, had we not had the, the response that we've had, not only locally, but statewide, I mean, this bill is crafted now. It used to be a statewide bill. It's now just Metro. Um, we're still getting support from the big four across the state. My counterparts across the state and the 11 MPOs are mobilizing their groups locally to fight against this because it's just a horrible precedent to have the legislature pick projects and then try to design them. And there's been a, the other, we talked a little bit about last time, is the other undercurrent, as Michael has, has addressed as well, is for the governor's office and the commissioner to basically make the point that this is really an infringement upon the responsibility of the executive branch. And since you have a super majority, and you know, it's a little bit more awkward. It would be a little easier for the governor to be a little more open about that if you had a little more partisan support in the General Assembly. Uh, but nonetheless, it's happening. And I think that's helping as well to sort of speak to certain members. I, I had personal conversations up there with a number of legislators that, that were there uh, time I was more actively involved in this and I would say without question if they had something to do to get this off their agenda they would love to do that th th there's not this great eager feeling about getting into this issue and doing this it's come down through a political process as we all know and so they're held accountable in that political process when they I think personally many of them understand exactly how this kind of thing really should be dealt with but they're caught up in the politics of it. But we can't let up. I mean, because yeah. things happen at the last minute unexpectedly. Um, the nightmare scenario, I think, uh, from our certainly from my well, from our perspective, would be a quick motion on the floor of the House to accept and conform to the, the language of the Senate bill, and then somebody quickly says, "I second that," and then the, the, the gavel falls, the vote's taken, and it's done. And in, in less than a minute we would end up with that Senate bill as the House uh, conforming legislation, and then the only action after that would be the governor's veto. But as, as my, I don't want to leave the impression that that's what's going to happen. I think Michael is right. I, they'd have to vote on that motion. Yeah, well, they'd have to vote. Oh, yeah, there'd be a vote on the motion, yeah. But as you know, Reggie, it would happen so fast. It would be something that would just be slam, 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 and then it's done. And uh, Oh, yeah, they'd have to vote on that motion, absolutely. If anybody's doing it. Yeah. <laughs> If they pass two different versions, yeah, and, and I mean, and that would be the other option would be if they have two different versions. If these two versions passed as they're currently written, then it would go to conference. 
Um, but if one or the other house decides to vote to conform to the other house, the companion bill's language. But, and that's more common though. I often hear many conferences at the state level. Yeah. It's just typically uh, an amendment to make the bill in, yeah. the, in one of the chambers from the other. Um, and sort of in the Senate's ahead, schedule-wise, and that's yeah. the, that's good. if that gets passed through the, uh, on the floor, then now it's a viable yeah. bill f to be accepted at, um, uh, in the just, House. Just putting it bluntly, if, 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 if Senator Tracy wants to be able to campaign on having taken the position, then clearly the way that that gets worked out is the House version gets passed in the Senate. I mean, they just go ahead and they conform to it. I got the bill through, then I lost it on the floor kind of thing, as opposed to a conference committee where then people by name have to, I gave up on this and gave them that. So it's, and the same thing happens in Congress. I mean, it's a similar thing. Cool. And that's 15 minutes, and we have 94 <laughs> slides left. <laughs> No, well, I agree. Talk fast. Oh, I will anyway. Well, it, but I don't want to go, I don't want to, I'm happy to talk fast, but I don't want to move through the issues too fast. Um, any other questions about the, you probably have a lot of questions about the mechanics of all this, and, and I don't intend to answer all of them now, but it, it's good that you are aware of the players involved in picking projects and, and getting these projects programmed and on their way to project development. Uh, and, and you know how to get in touch with me now, uh, and so I can answer whatever questions you have about the plan's relationship to the TIP, the TIP's relationship to the STIP, and the STIP's relationship to the three-year work program that gets approved by the legislature every year. We've, uh, there we go. This is a map of all the, the roadway projects currently in the plan, and those, these are all resources that are available to you online. This was the, the graphic associated with the vision for tr mass transit across Middle Tennessee that was adopted into the plan. And this is really what we're gonna probably spend most of our time on today. And you can see it's not a one size fits all solution to transit. Uh, a lot of these recommendations are very intentional and they're context sensitive in terms of the understanding of what markets exist in each corner or each community. Um, but you know, very quickly, you've got three rapid transit lines, one to Gallatin, one to Murfreesboro, one to Franklin, or Another way of looking at it is into Nashville from Franklin, Murfreesboro, or Gallatin. These would be uh, dedicated lane transit services that run all day long at pretty high frequencies. Uh, it could be a bus rapid transit line and dedicated lanes, it could be a light rail uh, uh, line, but this is a high capacity transit option that would run all day long. Different than our Music City Star commuter rail service to Levin, which operates only in peak commuting uh, periods. We also uh, wanna extend the commuter rail up to Clarksville uh, and upgrade the line to Lebanon, but these are commuter rail services. These are services operating largely in freight corridors. Uh, they'll tend to put most of their emphasis in terms of service during peak commute times, but there are commuter rail lines across the country that operate all day long. They just don't have the 15 or 30 minute frequency that you would associate with like a light rail or a more rapid transit line. And then in the other corridors uh, where we don't really see the level of congestion that would warrant heavy capital investments in the dedicated lanes, you know, we're envisioning over the road coaches that do offer nice comfortable rides, Wi-Fi, uh, potentially television with news, um, uh, uh, um, you know, serving uh, transit customers in those other corridors. But more, I think more compelling than what's happening in the corridors is what we're calling for within each of the circle areas. And so the plan gets into pretty good specifics as to you know, what kind of local transit circulation services should exist throughout the region in order to support those major capital investments in the corridor. And the AMP project is really uh, core to this dark blue circle here. It's part of the urban core fixed route system. It's a rapid transit line, but it's um, that's you know, maybe seen as uh, the only line that local residents would use, but it's tying all these, uh, all these routes uh, together in the spine along West End. Main Street, East Nashville. But we'll get into some of this in a second. And these are all the sort of, uh, you know, the general talking points that we use. And the reason why I'm showing you these now is because they are talking points, but all the data I'm about to show you in the next 10 minutes uh, back these claims up, right? Sort of speaks to these three reasons why we're uh, interested in mass transit. Uh, you know, when we think about Middle Tennessee, um, you know, we start talking about transit, it's, it, 
there's some people that only like to focus on the positives. Um, I'm not one of those people. I like to focus on the negatives to figure out what we need to be doing to make ourselves better. And uh, one of the negative things about Middle Tennessee, if you look at that graph at the bottom, is that we we're not keeping pace just with the standard bus service uh, with our peers. So the level of service that we're providing on the transit system is far below our peers across the country. And I can add 20 more metropolitan regions to this table, and you'll still see that Nashville is under-investing in levels of transit service. While at the same time, if you look at roadway lane miles per capita, um, we, we are exceeding expectations, exceeding the performance of peer communities. We have built a lot of roads for the population that lives in Middle Tennessee. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Uh, we like roads as well. But we're out of balance here. We are underperforming significantly on the transit side, overperforming significantly on the roadway side. And these two things in combinations has a lot to do with uh, the sprawling land development patterns, the long commutes in the car um, uh, that we see every day. So this is, uh, I'm gonna walk through the population employment forecasts, which are really framing the conversations for the update to this plan, the 2040 plan that we'll have adopted next year. It used to be the case that we'd go around uh, in our presentations and you hear the mayors talk about how we're adding a million more people by the year 2035. But the new tagline is that the region will be over three million people by the year 2040. And what, what that means is that by, by that period of time, maybe even sooner, we'll be you know, bigger than the Denver metropolitan region is today. And I think that's very important because it can be instructive for us to understand what we need to do to prepare for that type of growth. We can look at what Denver looks like today. We can study the last 15 to 20 years of growth and development in Denver and how they've invested in infrastructure and learn lessons from their experiences en route to where we're headed. And oftentimes you'll hear me reference Denver as a futuristic peer, something that, um, that we can study their progression of investments uh, to help uh, shape what we ought to be doing here. So over three million by um, 2040. And so we're sort of in between a Denver and a Seattle with respect to the metropolitan scale uh, by that period of time. The population forecast that, we're, um, that we use comes from a national forecast that allows us to look at growth in Middle Tennessee relative to other counties across the state or the nation. Uh, we can also, uh, with our forecast, we can look at the demographics of the, the folks. We can also look at the types of jobs that are expected to occur here in association with those national forecasts. What we've done here is we've shown Middle Tennessee's expected growth relative to the rest of the state. And these are really compelling really compelling figure. So the 10 county region that the Transit Alliance represents, it's about 27% of the state's population back in 2010. By the year 2040, we expect it to be more than a third of the state's population. But even more uh, uh, interesting is that uh, in these national forecasts that we're using, we see that over half of the state's growth is expected to occur in the 10 county region here. Uh, and that's gonna yield some really interesting outcomes. One of those being that Rutherford and Williamson County both are gonna leapfrog Chattanooga-Hamilton in terms of population by then. So imagine two Chattanoogas and the counties to Nashville South, right? Um, that's heavy to wrap your, your brain around, those two counties individually leapfrogging Chattanooga over that period of time. And this is a look at population across the state um, and sort of the look at the top 10 most populous, populated counties by that period of time. And you can see the 10 counties of Middle Tennessee stick out like a sore thumb with respect to their influence on a map. We won't get into this. Uh, you understand that they're changing demographics. Uh, people are, are um, in the future are gonna look different than people look like today with respect to racial and ethnic uh, composition, with respect to age distribution. Uh, some. Um, trend line suggesting that uh, there's a lot we need to be doing to provide for mobility for an aging population. Uh, another key demographic shift or lifestyle shift is the presence of children in household is going down pretty rapidly. If you consider that back in the 1960s, about half of households had children living in the household, and that number has really bottomed out uh, uh, to 2000 and it's continuing its trend line down. And you think about the influence that having kids has on where people choose to live, which is really what led to a lot of the suburbanization um, for single family homes and, school dis and good school districts. And you consider that that dynamic is changing, you can begin to get, get a sense of how people's decision making process for where they wanna live uh, may also be impacted. So we're trying to get ahead of some of these demographic shifts to make sure we have the infrastructure in place uh, to support movements in the places that people wanna live in the future. 
Uh, it's not good enough uh, in terms of identifying transportation deficiencies to just look at population employment at the county level. So we've got a couple of models that we use to predict where within the region people are gonna live and work. Uh, and these are just some of the inputs. I don't have time to get, um, I wanna get us back to discussion here in a second. So I'm just gonna sort of skirt through these images. These are some of the inputs that we use in our land use model. Um, land use policy, land development regulations. We look at mar market suitability, which uh, is a submodel that mimics the markets, uh, force, market forces with respect to uh, land development patterns. Uh, anyway, we put all this together, loaded up with that three million people and asked the model where people are gonna live and work across the region. And these are the results that we just unveiled this morning at, uh, at our board meeting. What you see here is the 2010 development pattern. Those are all the parcels that were developed back in 2010, plus the, I, having skipped over the map, I didn't also explain that this would have also included the environmentally constrained land, so the lakes, the parks, the things that have been land baked, or uh, the properties that are too steep for development. They're, they're in black on that first map as well. What you see there in 2020, 2030, and 2040 are the parcels that are being newly affected by growth in each of those decades. And when you put it all together, this is the cumulative impact of the effect of growth on individual parcels across Middle Tennessee. These maps are uh, very powerful and illustrating the enormous amount of growth that's coming our way, but I wanna be honest, these aren't, these aren't density maps. These are just telling us if a piece of land will be affected by development. So you could have a 50 acre lot that's getting a couple of households and it's turning black on this map. So the next thing we do is we look at uh, this growth and development um, in, in the form of density. So this is people and jobs by census block in 2010. This is 2020, 2030, and 2040. And we see a couple of trends emerging in, these, in this view of the data, the same data, just different view, right? Um, we see that continued suburban sprawl into rural lands, which is problematic for a couple of reasons that we can talk about. But we are beginning to see, since the last time we did this analysis five years ago, we are starting to see more intensification through urban infill redevelopment in our existing centers and quarters. And that bodes well for the future of transit. But we need to see more of that in order to uh, create viability for high capacity. Michael, could, could yeah. just a quick interruption on that, because so many of, of, of us have been involved, as you have, in the Nashville Next process, mm -hmm. which will be putting out scenarios that will look different is it fair to say that what you're showing here is based on trends? Current policies. Current, po the current yeah. policies and yeah. trends. Current land use policies and yeah. regulations. Uh, and one of the reasons why uh, there's a difference in what we're seeing with respect to the future is that a lot of the local communities have updated their comprehensive plan since the last time we did it to be you know, more cognizant of the, the, the stuff coming our way. Uh, you know, that's, what, that's what you do every day, Kelly, right? Are you still comp planning at Franklin? So it's really, those are the people on the ground that are creating the environment for transit to work. All we do at the NPO level is piece, piece that all together and analyze it to show people the performance of the policies that are in place with the hopes that they go back in and optimize those policies to create a better future. When you say policies in place, like you, you, you as the NPO have a plan, a 2035 plan, uh, which includes uh, uh, in, increased in infrastructure and Yeah, no, that's a really, that's actually a really smart question, whether you meant it or not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'll explain why. Uh, just run with it. No, it's a really, it's a really smart question. Well, what we do, and so um, going back to Diane's question, what I'm showing you now are the things that we're looking at before we develop a plan. So every, we start fresh. Not every MPO does that. We assume nothing that was in the previous plan is gonna roll forward into the new plan. So we start fresh with new analysis to see where we're headed. And this is the analysis that goes in to form sort of our understanding of the future. So, um, but the smart part of your question is, that's, but that's what's happened the last couple of decades, right? So we're required sort of to look at how current policies, current adopted policies are, are shaping the future. And then we identify deficiencies associated with that future and then we invest in projects that meet the deficiencies associated with that future, regardless of how much we like or don't like that future. So that's decades now of investment into projects that do nothing more than reinforce 
the outcomes associated with the policies that we all may agree aren't really getting us to the future we want. Does that make sense? So, right, so if all we did was we looked at the future as it's currently plotted, uh, even if we decided that outcome was not desirable, uh, we, uh, you know, we across the country have just been pumping projects into the pipeline that meet the demand associated with that future. Instead of using our transportation dollars to alter that future, to invest in alternative land development scenarios. And that's why, uh, that's the intelligence of the stuff that Franklin is doing, that's the intelligence of the stuff that Nashville Next is doing, is they're doing an iterative process to understand the trade-offs associated with different policies before they're put into place. Uh, because I would think if you have light rail, Mara, whatever, a corridor, you're gonna have natural growth patterns on that corridor because you have transit. Right. But historically, what we've done is we look to see what the future is going to be to justify, uh, to so see what ridership would be there if we just plop down light rail. We know that the plopping of bright light rail would change everything, right? Changes the market demand. Cities and counties would have to revise their policies and regulations to, to deal with the increased market demand for real estate around those stations, right? So it's got to be iterative, iterative for, for the future for there to be a, a proper feedback loop uh, to make all this work. So I'm gonna, these are all just great visuals that you're free, you know, that you can adopt into to your own work uh, that show where growth is expected to occur between now and 2040. I wanna get to uh, the traffic forecast because that's also a pretty uh, compelling thing. So after we forecast where people are gonna live and work within a region, we give that data to a, a travel demand model that uh, will predict how people will travel on the roadway system or the transit system or whatever networks we give it. And this is the results of that process that we just unveiled this morning. So this is the NPO planning area, all the major routes. This is 2010 congestion. And we're showing con congestion in two ways. We're showing the dark red lines are roadways that are over capacity. So there's more cars on the road during peak time than that roadway was designed for more of an engineering measure. And then the other lighter red, which you probably can't pick up from where you're sitting, um, is congestion as we see it based on travel time. So the, the roadway may not be over capacity, but the speed of the roadway is operating at, at a, uh, less than what really is tolerable for, for most folks. And we use a 70% threshold for that. So the red lines are roads that are operating 70% of the expected free flow speed for that. that um, this is 2040's forecast. Um, the assumption here is that we're building out our TIP. So all the projects that were constructed via the TIP that was adopted in 2010, we're building those projects out, but nothing more. And this is what happens when you add more than a million people onto, onto the system. The congestion uh, really lights up. Um, and as uh, stark as that map is, this next map is what happens after we build out all the construction projects in that $6 billion plan that I mentioned earlier. All those road projects we looked at, uh, these are all those roadway projects, and then this is the resulting congestion. It doesn't mean we're not improving travel speeds, but we're not getting them up to the point where they're not considered congested, congested any longer. Awesome. Yes, sir. Does that include any surface transportation improvements that are made by third parties like developers? That, does, that network doesn't include interconnection of neighborhoods and shortened trips it, it, in some cases it does, where we know that information and where we think that information contributes to supporting the, the major roadway network. So the collectors and above are there, but not the local streets. Um, but that's a good point. So the stuff that the private developers are doing as they build new communities isn't always included, but typically those tend to be more, more of a negative effect onto the mo major roadway network than a positive effect because of the way they're sort of loading single points onto the, um, it's a good question. So that's after $6 billion worth of investment in the roadway improvements. This is another way of looking at congestion. Uh, th this map is showing individual roadways and their level of congestion. This map is showing you uh, congestion in areas, quarter mile areas. So it's looking at multiple routes within an area. It's just a different way of looking at the same data that's a little bit more meaningful. It's also now scaled to the level of congestion, and so the yellowish orange lines are what we call the moderate congestion, and those are the lines that relate back to the red, red lines that you saw on the previous map. So this is 2010, and then this is 2040, even after we build out all the roadway improvements included in the adopted 2035 plan. 
Okay, these are some of the numbers that, that we're seeing, uh, and these are also pretty, uh, pretty heavy to grasp. So we've got about a 76% increase in people, 81% increase in jobs. Take a look at the trips per person. We're not expecting people to take more trips per person. The total BMT, that's the vehicle miles traveled, uh, is increasing. That's sort of like tra the traffic volume is going up 86%. The uh, vehicle miles traveled per capita, though, is decreasing. So we're, we're expecting people to drive a little bit less, all right? So that's maybe the end of all the good news I have for you. The bad news is, despite people on average maybe driving sh uh, a little bit less distance on a daily basis, we expect the time in car on a daily basis to go up by 113%. So that's more of a doubling of the amount of time we spend in vehicles to travel about the same distances that we're traveling now uh, on a per capita basis. And in large part, that's due to 26% uh, uh, reduction in travel speeds across the system. And this is, we're looking at peak, peak hours here, so this is not a 24-hour forecast. And then some of the other measures we're looking at, 162% increase in the traffic volumes that are occurring on congested routes, 141% uh, increase in uh, the, the miles that trucks travel through the region occurring on congested routes. Um, and we don't have time to get into this now, but you know, moving freight efficiently is uh, just as important to the national economy as get, getting people within the metropolitan area moving efficiently. And that's one of our responsibilities, is to make sure that we can get freight moving through the urban areas of America, which is where their bottling net, uh, bottlenecks are occurring, moving them through uh, as efficiently as possible. And this doesn't require just roadway investments, but also this notion of trying to get freight and commodities and goods onto to rail and, uh, and barges uh, where it's practical to do so. But these are you know, standard performance measures that we track. And we can zoom into the region, look at individual corridors or individual communities and see how these numbers look as a result of the growth and development. Michael, we could also. Yes, but, well, you know, who knows, right, for sure, but that's the prediction. But that's, the, that's assuming no additional improvement in service. So that's, we're not doing anything to change the bus service as it exists now. We're not investing in any mass transit. Just the growth and developments, deterioration of the roadway system oh, will okay. shift, thir you know, create a 33% increase in transit. When we begin to build out, because what we'll end up doing is we'll model the transit routes that we'll talk <laughs> about today or some other day. Uh, <laughs> and we can see what the ridership for those routes would be based on our assumptions for growth and development. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but let me, this is, uh, so what this is saying, this is, this is hours. So this is 0.8 hours is what we're spending on average daily uh, per person. That, and so the 113% increase puts us over an hour and a half, I, you know, I guess. Uh, you'll have access to all this stuff. And then the last column that sort of popped up here uh, while you weren't looking, shows us how those numbers change, change after we improve the roadway system with the $6 billion I talked about. So mo most of these measures remain largely unchanged at the system level. At the quarter level, we may see more improvement than what we're seeing overall. We are so seeing a, an 8% improvement in VHT, or the amount of time we're spending in our car. So we're adding enough capacity to buy down some of that time we're spending in our car. But What's the difference between 113% and 113% minus 8%? And it's not 113 minus 8, but 8% of, you know what I mean? It's not real world difference in terms of the improvements in overall performance. So this all has costs. We talk about $6 billion is what we have available to invest in transportation, and that sounds like a lot of money. And it would be a lot of money if it were in my bank account. But when it comes to infrastructure, it's just not going to cut it. The Texas Transportation Institute, which produces a report every two years that ranks all the metro areas of the nation with respect to congestion, uh, they also uh, estimate the cost of that congestion in terms of fuel and time spent uh, sitting in traffic. The most recent figure is $800 million a year for the Nashville urbanized area. This is not the 10-county area or the 7-county area. This is the area just generally around the city of Nashville, $800 million a year. 
is what we're losing in wasted fuel and lost time. That's 20 billion over the life of our plan that only has 6 billion in revenue to pump into improvements to try to buy down that congestion cost. This is another way of looking at the financial burden of our transportation system on, uh, on households. On average, I guess these numbers are still pretty current. I put slides together and sometimes they last a couple of years. Diane, do you have any more recent info than this? But on average, about 18% of a U.S. household budget goes to transportation costs. In Middle Tennessee, uh, over 90% of our households spend more than 20% of their budget on household transportation costs. Compare that with a place like Denver, one of our futuristic peers, where 42% uh, of their households spend more than 20% on uh, their budget on transportation costs. And this is increasingly important too, as regions, try, metropolitan areas try to be attractive to folks by being an affordable place to live. You might be a place with relatively low mortgages, but when you add on the transportation cost, the housing and transportation costs in our area are just as expensive as say at Denver, where their housing costs may be higher, but their transportation costs are lower. These are um, eating into our discretionary income, um, which ultimately will have a, a much larger economic impact than just to the bottom line of a, of a household. We're also not just fixated on the amount of time we're spending in our car during congestion, but the total amount of time we're spending in our car, period. And whereas the Texas Transportation Institute will typically rank us um, in the 20s for the worst congestion in America. On a per capita basis, we're actually the 11th worst in the country with respect to the amount of money we're spending on fuel and lost time and congestion. But regardless, that's focused on congestion. This th is another report that looks at the total amount of time we're spending in our car during peak periods. Uh, and it ranked the Nashville metro area worst in the country with respect to the total time we're spending on average. And that has more to do with just the distances that we're driving to get to and from work every day just really underscores the, some of the problems associated with the sprawling land development pattern in Middle Tennessee but on a personal level. It's also contributing to uh, personal health. And it, it's no coincidence that the epicenter of obesity and all the obesity-related illnesses are in the southeastern part of the U.S. where we've built, uh, built communities around the car um, and uh, created lifestyles that are over, overly sedentary compared to other parts of, of the region or the country. And this isn't purely a transportation policy issue, but transportation policy and the way we're building communities through transportation investments is one of the, one of the tools of the tool bag to start addressing um, this healthcare, uh, well, health problem in America, which is gonna be exacerbated by the healthcare problem in America. So that's some of the evidence that we're looking at when we start thinking about, well, how do we wanna make investments? And so uh, and mechanically what we do is then we try to get quantitative measures of how well projects improve all of these things that we just talked about, health, uh, quali local quality of life, uh, commuting times, gen general travel times. Uh, also, we want to invest in things that reinforce uh, good plans instead of empowering bad plans. Uh, so we try to quantify all of that, and that goes into a scoring system that allows us to sort of rank order projects across the board from an interstate project down to a sidewalk project that's on a roadway and sort of the basis of our positioning of projects through the planning process to get them into the plan and then ultimately the TIB. Now that's the uh, sort of the general context with respect to growth and development, but also, you know, it doesn't take people like me to go around showing maps of congestion for people to know they don't want to be in congestion anymore, right? So when you poll people, um, it completely validates what, you know, I don't want to call myself a scientist. I was about to say what the scientists are saying. But it validates, you know, people get what we're talking about, which I think is why these slides are so compelling, is you don't need to tell people that they're spending too much time in congestion. And so when you ask people what they want out of transportation investments, I mean, across the board, poll after poll at the national level, state level, and local level, people say we need more transit options in our area. And if they were in charge of the budget for transportation, that's how they'd use their money. This is a picture from the, uh, I only work pictures into my presentations whenever I can point out Ed Cole's uh, appearance. That was the adoption hearing for the tra transportation plan that we adopted in 2010. But these were the three main things that we were wanting to accomplish with our plan. And when it came to uh, sort of roadway investments, what we're looking at really was preserving and enhancing existing routes, reinvesting in those routes with technology, roadway widening where it makes sense, 
but also completing those streets to accommodate other modes of transportation uh, in a safe way. This is a picture from the bill signing ceremony for the RTA enabling legislation that we passed back in 2009. Ed was there too, by the way. <laughs> and uh, anyway, this was a major milestone. Uh, it was really, when, when we look at the timeline for implementing transit across Middle Tennessee, even though there was significant effort before 2009, it's really where we start the timeline with respect to the modern movement. Um, state enabling legislation got put into place in 2009. The political leadership organization necessary to move forward on dedicated funding to get this implemented was created in 2009 by way of the Mayor's Caucus. The private sector advocacy group was also created in 2010. That's the Trans Alliance, the business case for investing in mass transit. So that's a checklist uh, off the things that we need to do to get this done. The policy, the public policy to support transit is now in place with the adoption of the 2035 plan. That's a, that's a roadway plan that is positioning transit as a major policy initiative, right? That was done in 2010. The RTA is now reconstituted under the new law that happened in 2012. The MPO is currently in the process of expanding its footprint in order to take in uh, counties that want to be more directly involved with shaping those projects in their area. Uh, that should be finished next month. Uh, education and outreach is always an ongoing uh, thing. Um, the next steps, and give you a sense of where we are now, uh, we're continuing to do quarter level studies in order to identify projects. So we talk about rapid transit, talk about commuter rail. We need to turn those into projects with termini and distances and technologies and alignments in order for an agency to begin to implement them. That's what, uh, that's what we're doing now is trying to turn those concepts into projects. We're also working in the Mayor's Caucus and working through the Transit Alliance to identify the, the tolerances for increased revenue and what maybe some of those options might be to get increased revenue for dedicated funding. That's underway. Uh, it's, not very, uh, it's not a very public discussion yet, um, and no decisions have been made with respect to uh, what direction we might take with respect to funding dedicated funding, but that's, those conversations have been underway now for a couple of years. The next uh, Im most immediate step is once we have those projects identified, we need to prioritize them and put some schedule to them, put some uh, definitive cost to them. And that, that part is about to kick off by way of the RTA master plan. So uh, the RFP request for proposals for our RTA master plan should be issued in the next few weeks. And this will develop RTA's first ever master plan. And what that master plan will do is basically operationalize that transit vision that's part of the transportation plan into any other capital improvements budget that a city might have for its public works department. You'll have that kind of list that comes out of that process eventually. Then once you have that, you can tell people what you want them to pay for, uh, get approval for the de dedicated funding that may be a ballot initiative, it may not be a ballot initiative, we don't know that yet, but we need to put forth dedicated funding to not only pay for our share, but to leverage the federal funds, like the New Starts money that the AMP is getting. Those dollars are very limited without dedicated funding. So that's a look at the uh, for the, uh, if you want to think about this linearly in terms of how we get transit implemented, this is a, a look at that. So what I would normally do is uh, then kind of give you a tour uh, around you know, each of the quarters to give you a sense of what the vision is. Uh, and that's really, that's really great stuff. Um, but you know, I probably don't have time to get into that now. But the presentation will be available and I'm also happy to come talk to you individually or uh, talk with whatever group you'd like me to talk with and give them a tour of each of the quarters. There's some really good stuff in there. And then I would get into the, the funding challenges. Um, like we have serious funding challenges right now. I, I don't need to tell you that, but at the federal level, you know, we haven't raised the gas tax since 1993, and that was done by Clinton as mostly a deficit reduction initiative. It didn't really go into the highway trust fund. And we're so far behind right now that we'd have to completely zero out the federal program in 2015 and half of 2016 just to pay the bills on the projects that are already obligated. So they're in the tip and they've been obligated. So there is now a commitment to pay. We'd have to zero out the next year and a half just to meet those commitments. That's how far behind we are with the trust fund. And it's because we haven't, that, you know, you, this is a per gallon tax. It's, it doesn't go up with, there's no inflationary adjustment, so the buying power has gone down. Road building inflation was double digits for several years there. You know, as the global economy takes off and steel and concrete prices go up, labor prices go up, I mean, we're talking about double digit inflation on the cost of building things while our, our per gallon gas that's paying for this stuff is staying stagnant. And then on top of that, it's a consumption-based tax. So consumption per mile driven is going down as fuel economy goes up, so it's really, left us in a pickle where um, um, uh, we're in dire straits with respect to federal funding, and, um, federal funding. And then at the state level, 
you know, we're a pay-as-you-go state, and that sounds good, and it is really good. That's something to brag about. We have no debt with respect to transportation infrastructure. Um, but there, I would make the case that sometimes it's okay to bond at the state level and borrow money. When you have inflation rates far exceeding interest rates, um, you know, I think, you know, we could look at some options to accelerate some of the benefit of projects that way. I'm not encouraging the commissioner to take on debt, but we're a pay-as-you-go state, and that presents a lot of limitations for us in terms of capital investments. And as a result, uh, we, our programs typically focus on maintenance. That is also a good thing, but it's not, it's not a building program that's gonna keep up with growth and development. I don't think we should be doing less maintenance, that's not what I'm saying, but you know, um, we're, we're situated more in that, in that way, and it's not gonna deal with the, the growth that we uh, have coming our way. And I'd argue, uh, the sort of final point I'm, I make is that, um, again, we're not a transit agency. Um, we're not, uh, have in, no self-serving interest in um, positioning transit, other than, I just think that's the only way we're gonna deal with the red lines on the map. We're not gonna get rid of those red lines, but in order for us to continue to be economically prosperous, you gotta give people other ways of getting around those red lines. If you had rapid transit in some of those quarters where you've got intense red that represent congestion, if you had rapid transit there, uh, you can still move people freely. The travel times for transit aren't gonna go, uh, go up just because more people are using it. Um, that's the only way we're gonna continue to be economically viable as we continue to, to grow and develop. So, I'm sorry, Lydia, yeah, no, way over. So did anybody have any other questions about the TIA? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, can, I don't mind answering that question. So you know, the first way I'll answer that question is to reference what other what regions do. I'd say the most popular source of revenue for transit, um, it's popular because it has a lot of bang for its buck with respect to yielding uh, money for, for a system is the sales tax. So places like Denver, Denver has, they started out with less than a penny sales tax for transit, then they increased it, and then they promised to sunset it after their capital building program is down just to maintain enough for uh, operations. But I think at the maximum point, it was about a penny. That penny generated $250 million a year for transit in the Denver region. Compare that with about $40 million a year is what we have in local revenue right now for transit across the region. Um, and that's leveraging an enormous amount of billions of dollars in federal uh, over a period of time uh, in federal, federal and state investment into tr transit. So the penny uh, sales tax is really popular. Charlotte has a half cent sales tax within the city. Um, other places will do, uh, that's probably the most predominant. The property tax is used occasionally. The community I was in before I came back to Nashville more recently used a, a part of their millage, their property tax went dedicated into transit. Uh, we, we've been looking at, because the sales tax is a difficult proposition here, we're, we're already uh, just saw the tax foundation released its rankings for regressive taxes recently and saw Tennessee was at the top of the list for sales tax, combined sales tax rates, um, and that's due in large part because we've avoided other types of taxes here. Uh, actually, our overall tax burden is like, you know, New Hampshire and Alaska are the only two states with least tax burden than Tennessee, but we've put so much emphasis on the sales tax that it really makes that questionable option for us. So we're looking at things like uh, maybe like a, a, a will tax that you would pay when you register your vehicle. Um, again, these aren't endorsed, but we're looking at the numbers that we could generate off these uh, sources. We're looking at uh, what, you know, what a local option gas tax would yield. You know, local option gas tax is already legal in Tennessee. You may not know this, but counties can levy a penny gas tax for transit. Uh, Memphis tried that, um, was it last year? Yeah. They tried to implement that. And uh, it didn't go through, but when we were looking at that earlier, I had conversations with the Department of Revenue who were uh, uh, sort of against the idea because the way we track the sale of gas at the state level isn't really conducive to tracking it, you know, tracking where that revenue is coming from from a tax standpoint. Uh, I was kind of blown away by my conversations with them, but there's some mechanics that would need to be worked out to get that done. Uh, we looked at an emissions uh, tacking on a, a transit, uh, transit, uh, What's another word besides tax? We looked at a transit tax that you would pay when you, when you, uh, actually you have to legally use the word tax. Fee can only be used to pay for the administrative burden of implementing regulation, right? So the tax was what you could put to some other, some other use. 
So, but you could pay a tax when you, read, when you do your emissions testing or in lieu of emissions testing, if you've got a new vehicle, there could be some compromises there. The problem with emissions though, it's not, it's not probably gonna be sustainable as the fleet turns over um, and we don't really need to do emissions testing anymore. Cars will be cleaner. Also, only five of the 10 counties have emissions testing uh, right now. So we wouldn't wanna implement emissions testing to get a transit tax. Could you imagine that? It's like, we're gonna tax you for transit by way of a new emissions test, right? Um, but those are sort of the things we're looking at. Not, again, not to arrive at which one is the best, but just to see what, what we would need to levy in order to generate revenue that could put a dent in some of the stuff we're talking about. You mentioned Denver uh, brought in about $250 million Yeah, a year. Tax. What if the, uh, the state or the, the <laughs> local municipality brings that in? What kind of federal money do you expect with that? Like, semi-double? Yeah, there is. I mean, the, well, when I answer this question, recognize that I just admitted that the federal government has some things to work out with respect to getting money to even appropriate to these programs. But generally speaking, like the grant that the AMP got, that $27 million, which is the first installment of $75 million, that's from a competitive growth. It, that is like the most difficult money to get in the country. And the fact that we're even having to deal with the legislature right now after getting that money is just insane. That money is so competitive. And it was one of the highest scoring projects this time around. I mean, this is really something to be proud of with respect to that being a good choice for transit. But anyway, that's a 50-50 program typically. And that particular grant was capped at 75, so the maximum federal contribution to that project could have been 75 million. But it would be a 50-50 match requirement, state and or federal and non-federal. Uh, most other federal programs are 80-20. Uh, so we already get a lot of federal money. Well, I don't want to see the qualifiers like a lot don't do anything to uh, make any kind of case. But we get federal money already that we have discretion over. And those are typically $80, $20, 80 federal, 20 non-federal. And part of our strategy here is that you know, a lot of the projects that we have in the pipeline are just roadway projects. And our, our point is that instead of doing a roadway project this way that's just adding lanes, that's already being paid for with 80% 80, 80 federal and 20% non-federal <laughs> funds, let's just rescope that project and make it a a road transit project, right? So we want to repurpose some of the federal dollars you're already getting, and that's 80-20. But 50-50 on those large capital competitive grants and 80-20 for the formula funds that come to, to the MPO and to the state. Michael, could you mention a number I heard you say the other day, which I think is pretty powerful, um, the, the, what the average, I think you said the average American motorist pays. Yeah, awesome and, stuff, yeah. Yeah, uh, it, that, can you, can you? Yeah, mind? yeah. Well, yeah, I was, um, I'm sure other people have done this too, but um, I, was, I was getting ready for something that we did for the National Business Journal, and uh, I looked up, uh, did some sort of research on what we pay on average for a year for gas taxes. Anybody want to take a stab at what that is? Individually? Yeah. 100 bucks, yeah, because you were there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's about 100 bucks. Yeah. But don't you think people think they spend a whole lot more than that, right? So you, it, they put that in like into a sentence, you know, like we have used to have to do it in math classes, right? So you, uh, you're, you know, we're only spending a hundred dollars for the infrastructure that we're driving our car on, and our car is costing us like ninety nine thousand a year to, to own and operate on an. Animal. So we're paying nine thousand dollars a year for a car on which we're paying $100 for the infrastructure to drive it on, which is just mind blowing. And then, you know, our cell phone bills, and this is not even, this is like smartphones and like phones from the 1980s. The average cell phone bill is like 600 bucks a month or a year, right? So six times more on the cell phone than we're spending on the federal share of the infrastructure. I wanna say that, because the federal share, it's not the only gas tax you pay. The state also has a gas tax, but the federal share of the infrastructure that you drive on is one sixth of what you're spending on your cell phone bill. And I think when you tar start talking to people about those, with those, engage people on those numbers and the amount of need that we have, I, there's a lot of tolerance for the gas tax going up. And in fact, after that Nashville Business Journal thing, I've never had so many people come up to me afterwards saying, what do we need to do to increase our gas tax? Um, but in Washington, they know this too, but there's just absolutely zero interest in talking about taxes of any sort that it, completely shuts down intelligent conversation about anything that might actually be productive. I mean, that happens at the state level too. 
um, but it's certainly happening at the federal level. So it, Congress is already starting to work on the next transportation bill, and you know, sort of the funding is uh, accept. And the thing is, I talked about the shortfall in the highway trust fund. We're behind. We're paying for the shortfall. You know how we're paying for the shortfall? So our highway trust fund doesn't have enough money to pay the bills. You know how we make up the difference? We transfer it from the general fund, right? So we're subsidizing the highway trust fund with what, that's what income taxes, right? And you think most people are okay with that? Probably not. I mean, but we just need to have a conversation about it and um, open people's eyes to what's going on around them. I think um, there's a lot of latent support for increasing the gas tax. Now that's like a 10-year solution because before you know it, we won't be putting gas in our car anymore. <coughs> Yeah, those are great questions. We would normally get into some of that stuff. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, so the, in, the future is going to look differently, too, in terms of how you pay. So one strategy that's been deployed in some areas, you know how we have HOV lanes here in Middle Tennessee? They're very immature. They're not built out. They stop really when you need them the most as you come into downtown. So we have some work to do to build that out. Um, but some places are, have converted those to hot lanes, so you could, as a single occupant, you can pay your way into that lane. And then some places it even link that price to the um, to demand. So if uh, if it's a congested period of the day, the price is higher to get into that lane. So congestion pricing, that's mostly uh, I, you know that's not really a funding strategy. That's more of a operational strategy. So you can manage demand on the infrastructure based on pricing the infrastructure, but those congestion pricing systems are really just yielding enough revenue to pay for the systems to manage the demand. They're not really generating revenue. The other thing that you mentioned is really probably the future of paying for transportation, and that's instead of a per gallon, we pay per mile. Um, and there's some sort of near-term privacy issues with that. Uh, I think we get over that eventually. I mean, if you've got a cell phone, you're already basically allowing yourself to be tracked anonymously. You think anonymously, but maybe not so anonymously. Um, and that's the that's really the hang up. There's two hang ups with that. It's outfitting all the fleet with uh, with a device that can measure. Don't we have odometers already? Uh, I mean, it seems like we shouldn't let technology get in the way of simple solutions like analog odometers in the in the car already. But paying per mile is probably the way to go uh, in the future. And the specific technologies we use to capture that information and then to send somebody a bill. That stuff has to be worked out. And it has to be worked out across the country in order for it to be seamless. I mean, Oregon has piloted some of the technologies and some of the processes that may work, but it, it's going to be difficult for a state like Oregon to go it alone. How do you, I mean, it's just, it's got to be seamless. Oregon is a pioneer in all this stuff. Oregon was the state that gave you the gas tax, and they're likely to be the state that gives you the VNT tax um, in the end. They were the first state to levy a gas tax, um, and that was before the federal government had, uh, had done so. What other questions you got? What's up, Robbie? Uh, do you see any advantages or disadvantages in regard to policy for any other communities that are trying to be proactive? I mean, you have a lot of forecasters, you've got a lot of really powerful data to show here's what you think is going to happen. Is, is that, do you see, I guess, and you can probably talk to it from a national standpoint, do you see that as an advantage or a disadvantage as opposed to? Yeah, you know, I'd like to think even the NPOs that are proactive are also, you know, trying to fix the problems that are already out there. And maintain, maintaining the system, I've got 30 slides that show um, the cost of maintaining the existing asset, the roadways and the bridges, and I've got cost curves, the sort of minimum levels of investment that we need to meet, to, that we need to put on the table in order to meet certain standards for state of good repair. And those numbers are equally scary in terms of the level of investment we need to make just to keep things safe. Um, but uh, what's, the, what's the nature of the, the question with respect really, to the balance? This may be more of a mechanic-related question, but trying to justify a process, at least in a few mm. communities, that this is going to work because we see consistent out growth and development is going to occur in this area as opposed to another area. I gotcha. And yeah. saying, well, it's here, it, it, it's, you know, that may be better 
Yeah, because I think you all realize how much the infrastructure is shaping the market demand, right? I mean, the private sector is building, you know, it's doing the real estate development, but it's following public sector investment and in infrastructure. So we're, in a sense, we've been always been proactive with, uh, in a sense, because we've built infrastructure and then we've created demand in the wake of that investment. Um, and I'm oversimplifying, obviously, that relationship between public investment and private investment. But so, um, but what we're trying to do is, um, if we're, if investments end up leading to different outcomes, is to recognize what those outcomes are going to be before we make the decision to invest in that particular project. And what we're seeing in a lot of this modeling and the, the analysis, and this kind of analysis hasn't historically taken place in the decision making process. You you don't want to see how that sausage has been made over the last couple of decades. Um, but, but the more intelligent you can be about. Uh, understanding anticipated outcomes, the more you can make the right decision. And, and so also I, there's a fine line here in, talk, in terms of talking about transit as a way of shaping growth versus uh, transit as a way of fixing problems. Because I mean, in times of limited resources, people want to fix problems. They don't want to be speculative. I'd argue that there's not that much distinction between the two, except in the way we talk about it, just the semantics of it, that being proactive and investing in transit to shape demand and provide capacity in this form is because it, we're talking about systems here you know whatever happens to relieve pressure in one part of the system is going to be beneficial for the entire part of the system so a transit investment in this quarter is going to have an impact on another quarter without a transit investment just because everything is so linked together with respect to supply and demand for for traffic that was probably like the worst longest answer you've ever well, heard. <laughs> well, yeah, okay. I, I think maybe we got the gist of it out. But yeah, no, definitely. I'll follow up in writing. I have, a, I have one more question. Uh, you said in the beginning that your part of NGOs, and I'm not going to be mistaken about this, but uh, you're uh, responsible for implementing the federal funds. We, we don't build money. anything. Uh, sort of. No, the dollars don't technically flow through us, but the authority that the NPO board has is to authorize the funding for a specific project. Um, the state, though, is the one with the burden of administering the, doll the actual dollars. So the state is actually fronting, you know, if the state's doing a project, they're spending money, state money, and then they're getting reimbursed by the federal government. If a local is doing a project with federal funds, they have a contract with the state where they submit their receipts to the state, the state reimburses them, and then the federal government reimburses the state. So the state has this burden of administering funds that aren't necessarily theirs. And, and, um, and that actually, um, that's one of the things that gets really confusing with the legislature is that half of the state's budget is, TDOT's budget is federal funding that the state legislature doesn't really have authority over, but they have authority over the agency that's implementing or administering the federal piece, right? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that leads to a lot of, Ed and I were talking about that before the meeting today, what that does to sort of distort um, some of the decision making um, that goes into the process. Does that make sense? So we're authorizing the projects, and then what we do, we're. see now how they would feel like they're more vested in it because they're actually, you know, the money's kind of flowing to them. Yeah, yeah. From the state legislature. Yeah, and I, I don't want to ever give the impression that I'm not. Uh, that I don't think they ha they don't have a role. I think they do have a role, but their traditional role has been to appropriate the funds to the DOT to decide how, you know, to work with locals through the NPO process to pick the projects and to design the projects. Because that's what the legislation that's on the table is trying to prevent. You know, uh, they do have an oversight role, and obviously in how state agencies are run, uh, and that includes passing through federal funds. They just don't have the authority to pick which projects are paid for with those funds. Um, there's one more thing I was going to say, but um, I'll just not say it. <laughs> I just, I hope this has been a treat. Oh, <laughs> Thank you. We'll pick back up on some of these things now.
now, but I think now it's break time. Well, once again, um, thanks to Michael, and, and I hope you can see the complexity that, uh, that the, the MPO staff deals with. Um, I, I, we had uh, an, an invitation out to have someone from TDOT to come over and kind of talk about the TDOT perspective. We're still hopeful we'll get uh, someone over in the last two set, one of the last two sessions. So I'm going to just sort of defer that discussion that's on the agenda until that time with, with one exception and uh, to kind of build on, on, on the kind of world that Michael was talking about. And this is something that may be so obvious we just don't think about it sometimes. And that's the institutional structure um, that, we, that we have inherited over time to deal with the transportation issues that we're talking about right now. Um, one of those institutional structures is the evolution of state transportation departments. And we're not that far away from a time when we called them state highway departments. And if you go back, I must say, uh, then Representative Mike Murphy was in the House and he's very proud of the fact that he introduced the legislation that changed the name of the Tennessee Highway Department to the Tennessee Department of Transportation and that happened back in the 1980s. Um, and I, I say that to say that the culture of those organizations, and Diane has been in this as, 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 as have I, um, the culture of the organization, you know, it takes a long time to build and then to change. And so when I first came to TDOT, uh, we had a division inside a huge organization that was called the Multimodal Division. And that division dealt with transit, it dealt with the Short Line Railroad Program, um, Nobody was quite clear how bike and pedestrian fit into anything. Um, it was just a, a real kind of an add-on because of the culture that had evolved over the years, which was a reflection of American culture that sort of took transportation and didn't look at it as a whole, but we looked at it in terms of modes. And so at the end of World War II, uh, it was very clear we were headed toward transportation for most of us being a car and a road and all of our policies uh, for transportation in that sense were highway-oriented, car-oriented policies. And in large urban areas um, like New York and Boston and Philadelphia and Chicago, um, and then some later uh, areas that came to it like Washington, D.C. and Atlanta, Los Angeles, we had mass transit. That, that was the term that was used, mass transit. Not that cars weren't mass transit, but mass transit implied uh, a transit system that moved a whole lot of people that didn't have really many other choices uh, that were reasonable either in terms of income or in terms of uh, time that was necessary. And so you had these huge commuter systems uh, in these large systems, large cities that were, looked much more European in many ways than, um, than anything else. And, um, and so you had local transit agencies and, and Michael's probably cringing right now. I'm just, this is a real high level quick run over this. But you had local transit, like the Port Authority in New York, um, that uh, SEPTA in, in Philadelphia, that ran these large transit systems that relatively, uh, were relatively independent of the highway network. We certainly never heard of anything called bus rapid transit. Um, and where they did operate coaches, buses, urban buses on the, on the highway network, it was just assumed that the buses would fit within that highway network. And there were some accommodations made to stops and that sort of thing. But the idea of signal preemption or signal extension, any of those things, that was totally out of the picture. These, these vehicles just operated within the parameters that was developed by either the local or the state highway department. Um, and so what's, what's happened as, as we now enter this world of realizing that there are major changes underway. And as Michael Slides pointed out, public opinion is probably out in front of us on this. Because whether it's just a general feeling we need more choices, whether it's millennials who are saying, I don't want to have to inherit that world as much as, as your world. And then you know, my generation saying, I, I'm not going to have some of the choice that I've had previously. I'd like something a little bit different. I may have to have something a little bit different. Um, you have then those kind of pressures um, with these, the, these, who was it, Mitch Silver from Raleigh that made, the Raleigh planning director said that these are silos of excellence. 
So this is a non this is a non uh, confrontational or an overly critical, but you have these silos that are used to doing their work in transportation in a very specific limited way. And all of a sudden the world that, that we're beginning to see is a world where these things overlap. And so the institutional capacity uh, to, to adapt to that um, is something that I think we're seeing under, under strain. Whether it's in local government, here in Metro for example, uh, in Nashville, I'll just pick that one, one example, is uh, with the Public Works Department responsible for the street network, working in coordination with the state and working through the MPO process that Michael has described. The MTA operating uh, the transit system in Metro, in this case the AMP has become uh, a, a major project to them. Uh, administratively, those two don't have any overlap. There's no overlap. Um, and then you have uh, the Traffic and Parking Commission which is really more of a policy setting agency dealing with parking and, and traffic policies, uh, a lot of which interact very heavily obviously with the Public Works Department, but they operate kind of separately. And then we have, we were just talking a little bit a while ago, we, we have the, the transportation, uh, the, 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 the taxi cab, the licensing, that, that, that area is getting a lot of attention now with Lyft and Uber and these other uh, interesting new innovations on on-demand travel uh, support. And that's a whole nother part of metro government. Um, I'll never forget the time after a, a committee hearing in the House, in the Senate Transportation Committee, when then Senator Andy Burke um, called the commissioner and me up to the front afterwards and said, I don't get it. I, 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 who's, who, who, who integrates all this at the local level? And we had this extended conversation, and I think there is a link because when Andy became elected mayor of Chattanooga, one of his first executive acts was to create the Chattanooga Transportation Department to begin to put in the local government setting a, a, an institutional structure that would have this broader view uh, than just uh, the individual modes. So I, I just kind of put that out there because in many ways um, the, the behavior that we, we use institutionally as we move into these discussions are still operating uh, from uh, some, I think, some, some, some cultural traditions that are a little bit out of sync with what we all know is the behavior that we need. Uh, at the federal level, and I guess, Michael, I would say, other than in some areas of the United States, we've probably made more progress at the federal level. The Department of Transportation uh, has basically always been a Department of Transportation. Um, years ago, the Urban Mass Transit Administration was was, uh, was changed to the Federal Transit Administration. The Federal Highway Administration, I think we've seen um, a, a, a growing sense of, of overlap in responsibilities. And then, I guess now three years ago, the, the Obama administration, uh, the, the creation of the sustainability initiative that brought HUD in terms of housing and transportation and EPA, uh, and then they brought uh, Health and Human Services in later and uh, begin to see, you know, at least at the cabinet level, uh, an understanding that these issues are all interrelated in a way that necessarily, not necessarily that the uh, agency missions historically uh, have addressed. So I just will plant that thought. Um, we, I hope we can get uh, someone in from TDOT talk a little bit more about it because changes are occurring there uh, to kind of look at it in, in this more uh, multimodal way. So um, any, any burning last question? Michael's still with us. Um, I feel like any other questions that any of you might have while Michael's here or in on these other things? If not, Lydia, why? Oh, you did? Okay, what? Go ahead. <laughs>
time I'm picking just one thing, clearly. Um, clearly. <laughs> I'm torn between like sort of adding transparency to how we pay for infrastructure, being uh, high for first place in my mind, and helping people visualize what these investments look like within the community. So we didn't get into looking at the commuter rail projects in Clarksville, but some of the imagery associated with the vision for that project is pretty awesome. It's people excited about uh, these investments uh, in a way that <coughs> Transcends just talking about transportation projects. Sounds like he can help you with your project. Yeah. Really. He has lots of resources. And That's a slides. scrap question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm happy to. You, you know, you can have all these slides. And you, there's like 500 slides. No, all right, no, you can't just. And you can just pick and choose. This is a good list of version of your presentation. Pick and choose which section that you want to focus on. And you know, we got a, a, a great staff of ten folks who build and run these models and crunch the data. Where are you located? Downtown Nashville. Where now? Uh, you know where Electric Commission and the Planning Department is? We've got a super website too, so yeah. if you're putting your projects together, feel free to go there. And he's going to email me a PDF of this, which I will shoot out to you all, and then we'll also incorporate it into the final video that will be posted. And this is a good time for us. To, this is the year we're actually constructing the plan, um, and making the case, and then <coughs> 2015 will be the messaging of the plan to get it adopted. Anything that helps us construct that plan, I think this year uh, we'll, we'd have an interest in something we work on. And you might get some of their presentations. Michael will be back hopefully for the last session to view as well. You know, we're probably yeah. breaking with the groups right now, so feel free to get into your small groups and take all this juice, this flowing energy into something wonderful. We're going to be meeting right up here if you just come in. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so if one of the groups wants to go to the Institute, I, I, I can let you go down there as well. Have, there's three of you, right? Yes. I can do two here if one of you guys want to go down to the institute, or if you want to just meet out in the coffee area. I've been dodging an institute for years. So I'm not going to be here. We're all here, just sectioned off. Team Warner, right here. Yeah. Yeah.